I've been asked to share with you a presentation about the status of postgraduate research training in engineering in South Africa. This was a consensus study that was done by a group of individuals um, together with ASSAF. Um, and we, shall I say, introduced the report to the public um, just about one year ago. So some of the data that you will see in this report are um, it's not today's data, but the trends are all still valid. So bear with me when I tell you about this. The presentation is just as a teaser, more or less, to get you to go and read that report. Because in the report, there are lots and lots and lots of additional data which may be of interest to you, especially if you've got to make a case for advancing... Um, engineering studies at the PhD and master's level to get um, more people into this field and in which specific areas may be more appropriate currently than others. So we had to conduct a study um, of engineering education in South Africa and the team looked at quite a lot of different sets of data and we were ably supported by a very strong team from um, ASAF. Um, and then we had to identify from the data we got what are the systemic challenges that we may have to overcome as a country um, to support um, our industry. The individuals who were on this team's names are there on the, uh, on the slide. Uh, quite a number of us, and as you can imagine, it's not always easy to get everybody in one room. So we mostly made use of electronic media to do our job. The presentation itself will follow the key chapters within this book. It deals with the, um, some kind of a background, then what is the postgraduate engineering landscape within South Africa, um, what are we, the different universities, doing about training at, um, in our country? What is the gender dimension of postgraduate engineering training? What is the typical employability of all these folk that we are um, training? Um, and what's the real demand for postgraduate engineers? Um, which is not what we really want to hear sometimes. And then we looked at a number of international um, benchmarks. Um, to compare the efficiency of the South African postgraduate engineering education with that of a number of identified countries, many of them belonging to BRICS. And then a number of conclusions were made. And by now, none of these are really a surprise. So I'm not going to tell you how we got this. You can get that on the website. So... We do know that we are reasonably young and growing population, so we've got a large percentage of the country are um, youth. Um, and the industries that we mostly have are working in low to medium technology, which is probably not where we would like to be. And as time passes, we're doing less of that, so we are importing more than we really should. Um, we do have a respected tertiary education system, um, we've got a very supportive government, and for the science and technology people in the audience, I do understand the name has changed, but this report was done before that time. Um, and then, of course, we need economic growth, and we absolutely have to be competitive internationally. And to do that, we um, have to boost our postgraduate engineering um, education. Um, if we do not, we, um, we will fall behind. So we need people to participate in research and development wherever they are, and that's not difficult to get scientists and engineers to do that. Um, furthermore, we need to make sure there are enough activities within our country at a high level that will attract people from foreign countries to want to come and, if I can put it this way, play with us. 
um, because it's, um, this is the way we share ideas uh, and how one really produces new things coming out. Um, and science and engineering is not a South African endeavor, it's, it's an international type of endeavor. And of course, we must do everything to make sure that we stay internationally competitive, or become if we're not. The top driver for this competitiveness would be the talent that we have in our country. And if one looks just in this room and everywhere else in our country to uh, many of our universities, and I have the privilege to visit quite a number of them on um, accreditation visits. Um, we need to have the appropriate training and also life skills. It's not good enough to be an engineer in your head. You really need to know um, how to work with people um, of all work, works of life and how the industry works. We need really strong, integrated and practical infrastructure to do research. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. And the quality and availability of high-level skills in the country to support our high-level industries um, we, is, is absolutely critical for what we have to do in the future. And this is not only for high-level um, specialist engineers. It really starts with our artisans who have to be appropriately trained and be world-class in what they do. Um, because they are, they are the oaks that can tell you that you've made this really fancy design, but hell is not going to work because of this, that, and other thing. The material you chose is not correct, whatever, because they do it every day. Um, and we sometimes forget that. The future demand for engineers and high-level engineers and uh, would mostly be in the fields that we all know about, actually. Um, and some of these fields will run faster than others. Um, and I dread to call the word for IR. I, I think everybody uses that for their own um, goals in the end. But um, maybe, Yancy, we need a debate on what it really means. Did you did? Okay. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, so we have big challenges with water. Um, and I can see there's a lot of noise ma being made at the moment. Um, we've got our square kilometre array with lots and lots of data processing that needs to take place. We've got a challenge for renewable energy, smart cities, sustainability in general. And then this whole energy, food, water triangle that we've got to work with. Infrastructure that we're going to develop, develop for building... Um, local environments, developing environments, does it have to look like New York? It could be something totally different, and we need to work out what that would be. And it doesn't mean it's low-level technology. Um, we need much more industrial engineering, which is to optimize what we do and to get things to take place at the right time um, with the highest efficiency. We need to look at more at systems. It's not IT systems, it is systems in general. Um, my experience is that you can walk into a sales team or somebody or into a language school or into any engineering firm, if you like, even some of the big SOEs, if they do not understand how all the bits and pieces are put together and how they support each other and what the whole environment really looks like, we will hardly ever come to the right um, solution to problems that we have. And we often take the first little thing and say, ah, this is what it's going to be. And sometimes that solution destroys everything else. So one needs to be cognizant of that. IT, of course, will be a big thing. Um, animation and gaming, that is gaining a lot of um, traction at the moment. Um, and that's, this is in support not only for watching Pixar movies, um, but it is also about having very nice apps on your phone, to be able to um, support the medical industry, for people who want to do um, operations, whatever, over a distance. So it may sign, sound trite, animation and gaming, but it has, is a huge field in its own. And everybody is talking about big data. Um, I would include data science into that. It's not only about... Um, the huge sets of data, it is also about what we do with that. Um, and the whole economy may depend in future our efficiency and how we do things. 
um, on big data, on automation in that field, which does not only include AI. Um, we need to understand how to manage our facilities, our assets. We've got a lot of assets in our country and we basically let them go to rot because we do not manage that properly. Um, and it is sometimes because we don't know and sometimes because we do not see that if we have a proper IT system, a proper engineer, we can put all these building blocks together that it makes it much easier to know what we have and what we have to do. Um, and we can equip buildings and land and whatever with smart devices that will tell us over time when they need to be maintained or not. Um, the whole question of um, in, in process industries, we also need to find out what on earth do they have because things walk away. And then I put in .x, whatever you want to make that um, eat your heart out. <laughs> now, our research capabilities in the country, especially of engineering, which I know a little bit more than in the sciences, although I started off as a, I would say, an unskarky scientist. I did uh, physics and applied maths and maths to um, almost like honors level. So, and it was a very good tool for engineering. We've got really respected academic and public research institutions. Um, and we really should be glad that this is here with us. So we need to use them correctly. Many of us are working internationally and I see there are a lot of little booths here today of um, one-on-one -on -one of bilaterals. I never know whether there's only bilaterals or more laterals um, that we have between different countries. And of course, within different countries, they bring in different companies to come and work with us. And on very rare occasions have I found that um, working with an international company is a threat. It actually is not. It's very enriching. But of course, one must just watch your IP. Um, but if you have IP and you don't exploit it, it is also useless. So one needs to work together to do better things. Our R&D spending is probably not what it could be. Um, in terms of international measures, I think we are falling behind. And as the economy is biting, uh, many of the SOEs and also other private companies are spending less on research. Um, and development for that matter. And what they're also doing is, um, in certain sectors, they are transplanting this research efforts into other countries um, for all kinds of reasons, and that really trips us up when we would like to find good environments for high-level engineers to work. And then often we do not have, we're a very inward-looking nation. Um, and we really need to look at how do we become part of this much bigger village and we can start with our neighbours up north. So we need to build capacity um, and it must be an integrated system and of course we have to support our undergraduate stream. We must try and reverse the outflow of our talent because every time when one goes to a dinner party nowadays, the parents will tell you that they're going to this country and they're setting up their kids to go to that university. We don't want them to go, they must stay here. We've got even better universities, like most of you know, than are internationally available. And not every South African kid is going to get into MIT or Harvard, um, but there's nothing wrong with our local universities. Um, I've been at some of them and we can really give them a good go. They do have much more money, though. Um, <laughs> we have to attract international talent. And I, it looks like this is beginning to happen. And international talent to our research programs. Um, I did not put those graphs into this slideshow, but in the report you will see that quite a bit of our postgraduate students are from the rest of Africa which is a wonderful thing to happen, because this is the way that we all work on one common goal, which is to make this continent of ours the best. We must develop what we have and commercialize those. Um, that's not such an easy step, though. If you've got this fancy idea and you've just done your proof of concept, to go from proof of concept to something which is now a 
um, prototype and then later proper product, it's quite a journey. Although some people will tell you, oh no, so it's not just easy, easy, you just do this and that and the other thing. It's not true, like many of you probably already know. Um, and then we have to start working on small high-tech firms like one would get around in Boston or in San Francisco or Los Angeles or wherever or in London or other parts of the world. Um, it's happening here but at an extremely slow pace and the very high-tech oaks are just not quite always there. So this is our background. So what do we look like? We've got 14 universities and universities of technology that currently provide postgraduate studies in engineering. Um, five of those are University of Technology, and then of course we have UNISA, which is our distance education institution. And if one looks at the range of programs that are being delivered, it's huge. Um, and one could say that you've got to rationalize on, on all the different kinds of offerings but in many ways, if we, if we just keep it as it is, the interdisciplinary type of work that we can execute also in this field, and there are a lot of opportunities to work with scientists um, in this field, uh, or in these fields, um, we shouldn't narrow it down too quickly, because that will limit our creativity. And then one of our biggest constraints is like we can have as many PhD students if we like, but if we do not have supervisors, we're kind of stuck. If one looks at, you know, this is one of the older sets of data, but it doesn't, hasn't changed too much. The staff with PhDs per institution, and you can see most of the universities one needs another table here which speaks about the student staff ratio and how many students are actually registered in those, but it's not on this graph. Um, so you see there's quite a number of um, PhDs within these institutions and they have quite a job to then guide all these postgraduate students. But it's not on that one professor with a PhD or a senior lecturer with a PhD um, supervise 20 other PhDs. Um, it is not an efficient process. So we need to create many more of them. And I believe if you look at some of the next graphs where the increase in number of PhD registered students started in 2009. And it's about the time that anybody, everybody got kind of nervous about the lack of staff with PhDs as well. The next graph is about NRF research chairs. This is one of the measures to see whether um, a university is successful or where the big money is going into. Um, there are many other chairs at universities apart from the NRF research chairs. And in most of the engineering fields, industry comes nicely to the party to provide lots of funding to run centers and research chairs but it's more focused on their kind of needs than anything else. So, I was wondering what was the miracle? What happened in 2009? It's one year after, no, it's, yeah, it's about one year after we almost had the ESCOM first total blackout. Um, so, that could have been one of the triggers that we really need to start doing things. But it was also the time that most universities made their sums and say we cannot produce more PhDs, more masters, if we do not have staff with PhDs. Um, and so the, on, on this graph for master's enrollment in engineering from 2000 to 14, the average annual growth is a, um, just under 10%, which is not bad. If we look at the participation of race, because we all talk about how do we now transform to a different environment um, where more and more people of our country are participating, you will see that in this graph, that top part, in your eyes, I think it's yellow, and the bottom one is blue. The yellow ones are um, the people of European descent, and the bottom ones are our African people. 
and it is wonderful to see how this ratio has changed over this period of about 15 years and is keeping on changing. Um, so one should take our hats off to universities for getting this right. <laughs>